Hi, this is Kate Scanlon and you're tuning in to the Sofa Sessions podcast. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. My name's Kate um, and we're really happy to have you here at East London Dance. We are using microphones because we are recording it for a podcast and the podcast is called Sofa Sessions, um, something that I started over a decade ago and it was at a point in my life, I'll give you a bit of context, the point in my life when I just left breaking convention working with John Z and I was like, what the fuck have I done? And I felt so lost and I thought, I do. Why did I decide it was a good idea to work with myself on my own? And I was like, please, can someone else want to come and hang out with me? So I started meeting up on a sofa somewhere in London, having coffee and cake with whoever wanted to turn up. It was open invitation. If you were creative, you were welcomed. And we talked about different areas of creative business. And it went for about eight years. And then it sort of morphed into me walking up and down the road with my phone and filming myself like that at first, talking about creative business and connecting with people. And then it's now morphed into a podcast where I'm going to have lots of nice conversations with lots of people about interesting subjects. So this is Sofa Sessions, welcome. It's our second live uh, Sofa Session podcast interview. The first was with Popping Pete back in October and Capsule London are filming and editing for us, which is really great. And today's conversation, the roots of it start in the 80s in London. Um, and then more recently, the roots of it are in 2010 when John Z and I went to Toronto um, to talk to the Sony Centre about setting up the first international tour for Breaking Convention, which is smashing it all over the world. 21 years this year, this May. If you haven't got your tickets, get them. Bank holiday weekend, May, Sadler's Wales. You've got free park jam on the Monday and it's basically full of goodness all weekend. Hip hop, real hip hop. Anyhow, we went out to Toronto to meet the hip-hop scene to meet like loads of the community and there was a big event out there called Manifesto Festival um everyone from like Gene Gray was performing Rocksteady Crew were doing a live jam in Thunder Square and it was really brilliant it was just like such a great opportunity to meet everybody and one of the people we met was Buddha and we had many conversations and since that uh September 2010 he and I have connected several times in Canada on in on you know in messaging online and um, just talking about the practice and hip-hop and mental health and so when I heard he was going to be in London for like two days I was like oh my gosh we've got to do something we've got to have a conversation because his practice is really exciting and it is transformative and it's real hip-hop led by real hip-hop heads but with a backbone of social work um, and it's a really interesting practice. And at the same time, working here at East London Dance, we have Nzinga here, we have a great staff team here, and we do loads of work with young people and their mental health. And since Nzinga's been on the staff <coughs> team, that work has been really expanding to look at how we support artists and producers, our staff, our trustees, and how do we really embed well-being, resilience at the heart of everything that we do. So I felt like it was a no-brainer to bring these two people together to have a really nice conversation and to see what's going to come out of it. Um, I have written some notes so I remember what I'm going to be saying. It's in a circle because it's really important that we are seeing each other's faces. Uh, Hip-hop, the circle is sacred. This conversation is going to be deep and powerful and we want you to be able to connect with us, with each other, with yourselves. There may be some reflective tasks that we make you do. You won't have to act anything out. Uh, Maybe you will. But at the moment, we're asking you just to do some reflection. Um, there'll be some opportunities for questions. But really what we want to do is, rather than it being a dry panel where at the end everyone puts their hand up and pass the microphone around, we'd rather just get the tracks on. We've got Billy Business in the house. Get the tracks on, get some drinks, and just have conversations. So if you have a burning question, you're very welcome to ask it. Um, but we really want there to be proper people connections hugs hanging out not sat in a chair talking about this for the whole night so we're probably going to go for about an hour and a half and um, we might end earlier um, and then we're just going to have the good networking in person chatting connecting and we really hope this is the beginning of something really long term we have in Zynga. she's morphing her role is morphing here. Uh, she now has an impact across the whole organisation, which is really exciting. John Z is opening the first academy of hip hop in this country, possibly in the world for the, for the age group that he's doing it. He also has employed someone to look after pastoral care of the young people. 
there's another organisation in East London, again, wellbeing producer, is starting to happen in this country. And I just feel like we need to be connected um, because we're all trying to make this happen. We're all trying to use hip hop, heal ourselves, heal our communities. And so this is about connection. And last thing I'll say about Scanners Inc. is really all the work we do is through hip hop and street culture. And it's all about connecting people, connecting communities. There's not enough of it. There's not enough intergenerational stuff. There's not enough moments to connect through this beautiful culture that really is transformative. So I hope today you're going to hear some great examples of how this practice is happening in the UK and Canada. I know that lots of people around the circle have got loads more stories to add. So I'm hoping that this is the beginning of a long conversation. So we're starting with the baseline of our lives, the three of us. Um, I'm 48 next week, and in the 80s, we used to go Covent Garden twice a week. No, twice a week, twice a, a year. And I remember being there and watching hip hop and thinking, what the heck is this? Everyone in primary school was trying to be a b-boy, a beatboxer, and I just loved it, but didn't do anything with it. My work is really influenced by the 80s because in London in the 80s, everybody was on the streets doing their thing. Whatever your subculture was, you wore it loud and proud. You did your thing. You broke the rules. You didn't care about the rules. And there was stuff everywhere. And there was like permission, even though there wasn't permission, there was kind of like permission to do stuff in a very like demonstrating way um, and I feel like that has influenced like most of my work now happens in the street in parks in public places and I I love that that um, that that is where my work has ended up because it is basically my childhood it's funny because my sister obviously grew up in the same family doing the same thing she has absolutely no memory of ever doing anything like that in her whole life and hates London so we're quite different <laughs> um, but I think um for me it wasn't until I started working in hip-hop and being in this community that I found myself and it was a journey to my own acceptance and dealing with my own traumatized stuff that we all carry with us and don't recognize until we suddenly feel accepted and we suddenly feel like we don't need to try and put this like cloak on of being somebody. We can actually just be ourselves and that is what is celebrated about you. And this was like blew my mind and continues to be something that I want everyone to experience. So I'm going to pass the mic to Buddha. Uh, oh, yeah, that's true. I'm going to pass my mic to Enzinga. They're both basically going to introduce themselves. I'd really love for you to share with us, you know, a snippet of your life stories and, you know, yeah, your baseline. I'm so excited to be back here in London. Like, this is my therapy circle, so thank you. Um, 40 year, uh, 39 years ago, 40 years ago, I was here. And, and you know, sometimes you got to get old before you reflect back and connect those dots. And I'll, I've had a whole life of being a social worker. I did a master's in social work. I've done all the toughest jobs, you know, like child abuse investigations, running group homes, street worker. When I worked at the center, which is where I met Billy and Danny and, and Sipo and Yankee, like all the legends that from the UK, we were just youngins who were just trying to figure it out and excited about the prospect of new community. But fast forward, a lot of what I experienced from my days living here for five months created a trajectory for my whole life of an interest in my own healing, understanding it deeper. And I'm 65 this summer, summer so that's a long journey and it's still revealing itself on the deeper levels of healing. And I'm also kind of like, I'm tired of being candy coating some shit, kind of like not being fully honest about something, not being fully honest about how my trauma has affected my children. I carry a lot of guilt and shame. So this is therapeutic for me. And, and, um, are you guys okay if I share my, 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 my early hip hop moments? Um, because it also involves trauma, but it also involved me at age 15 learning that I didn't have to be a victim, right? Now, I think I've been a victim of myself. 
trapped in my own mind with that forever got to prove my shit as a b-boy right i started the canadian floor masters 41 years ago we were pretty famous back in the day used to go to the bronx hang out with the new york city breakers blah 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 right that's really important to me and i'm really proud of that but the deeper reasons of understanding why I had to go there and why it was important and why I felt comfortable with a Danny and a Feathers and Live to Break and stuff, that's worth looking into too. So check it out. When I was little, I'm gonna take my glasses off. Um, I grew up in Saskatchewan on the prairies. One TV station, religious TV, and something called Don Messer's Jubilee, people playing fiddles. Nothing for young people. My dad's United Church minister. Everybody loves my dad. He's there for everybody else. Big family, nine of us. But my dad was never there for his own kids. We were like the showcase minister's family. You know what I mean? But that was, I'm, I'm going to get to you guys understanding the trauma that, I, that I've been dealing with and how it's affected my brain. Um, so we moved down near Detroit, right? My world flips. 70s funk, are you kidding me? George Clinton, right? The roller rink, right? Earth, wind, and fire, all this stuff. I'm losing my mind, I'm so excited. But I'm gonna start school, grade nine. I'm the smallest kid in the entire school, bar none of 1,500 people. I'm smaller than the smallest girl, the smallest guy. I'm, I can't remember what I was. I think I was 85 pounds, four foot seven. My goal was, please God, someday let me be five foot. But I had friends in Saskatchewan. I had no friends now. I'm the new kid. In the gym, 500 people, bullies looking at me. Who's that little kid? And I look like a girl. We all rocked long hair in the 70s. You know what I mean? I had long white hair, my little beads, my satin shirt. Let me fit in. I just want me people. Boom, let's put him in the garbage can in front of 500 people and stuff him deep because he can't do nothing about it. So I climb out, catch up mustard, and I try to do that shit where guys laugh it off, like, ha no biggie. I'll fucking kill you someday, right? In my head. That shit went on all the time. Simple stuff. And I'm, I'm not trying to say, like, I was bullied worse than other people. But for me, I was already an emotional kid, a sensitive kid. And then this happened. And nobody stepped up. 500 people laughed when I was put in the garbage can. Get me alone in the corners, banging on my arms. I go home, my arms would be bruised. Wouldn't tell my dad, because my dad would roll up in the school, would cause some big shit, and I didn't want that. That would make it worse. At least that's what I'm thinking, right? <sighs> Worst one was um, Wedgie in the main hall where all the cool kids are hanging. Rip my underwear right out of my ass and hold it up like a trophy. Hold it there for five seconds. Show everybody. Show all the cool girls, and then throw my underwear down the hall. So when Columbine happened, I got it. I'm sitting there watching the news going, I fucking get it. If I had a gun, and we don't have as many guns in Canada as the States, thank God. Because in my mind, I'm like, I'm gonna, I'll get you someday. So we're getting to the good part. Well, before the good part. So what, what do young people do when they're, when they're feeling they got no one? My dad wasn't there. My mom was just trying to get by. So I, got, I wasn't feeling like I had love. I wasn't feeling like I have attachment. As a social worker, I heavily learn about attachment, about the importance of that, right? It's foundational in how we grow and needing that security so that our emotional range goes from this to this in a healthy way. Never happens when you have trauma. So I started doing a lot of drugs, mixing drugs, and I was doing them breaking airs where you just kick indoors. Now, why is it that I wasn't being a ninja to get the whatever I wanted? Because I didn't give a fuck. Because when you're that raging inside, you don't give a fuck. You're just like, if God is to save me or anybody's going to intervene, then you will. But if I'm supposed to get caught, if I'm supposed to die, then that's what's going to happen too. I'll talk more about that later, but it's a scary thing. And a lot of people in hip hop put ourselves at risk all the time in mental health because our self-talk becomes, I ain't fucking good enough. Even though we try to prove ourselves in the cipher, even though I became a pretty old B-boy. So, lying in bed, stone, devil, angel, on my shoulders talking to me. 
what do you like to do? You're a good kid. You're not a bad guy. Oh, I love to roller skate. Roller skating is everything. Six nights a week, rocking the red wheels. They play George Clinton. They play P-Funk, right? They play Marvin Gaye. They play solo songs, and you can ask a girl to skate with you and waltz to the beats. So then the devil's like, yeah, but the bullies are there. Yeah, but you love roller skating. Yeah, but the bullies are there. Yeah, but the cute girls want to skate with the best skaters. Boom, light goes off in my head. I, I call it my back to the lab moment. I stole the keys from the church, set it up, would practice doing like jumping up on tables, doing all these off, all this. I taught myself how to do round off two back hand springs, jump into the splits, press out of the splits, spin up, locker jump. And I gotta tell you, you only went in the middle of the roller rink if you fucking could handle the middle of the roller rink. We used to have skate crews that would come from Detroit. I see these black skate crews, shirts, rink rockers. They're froze another foot, Black Panther pick. You know what I mean? Like, like full dance routines on skates. Coolest thing in the world, I thought. I wanted to be like that. But I became that little kid. I would do that and literally look straight at the bullies like, what you got? That's a fucking hip hop moment in 1975. When I get together with other OGs from other cities, we talk about the importance of the Bronx roller rink and different places like this because it was a gathering and it had that music element and it had the, t it had the hormonal thing, you know, guy, me, girl, da, 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 all this. It's very healing and very natural for teenagers. Fast forward. I'm at university. I'm living with this guy, actually. He's a good old friend. And I just want to do craziness because I'm trying to prove to the world that, like, fuck you. I'll do whatever I want. I'll look whatever I want. And I'm a good person. But really, I wasn't just trying to prove to the world. I'm trying to prove to myself constantly. I'm still <laughs> trying to do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it short. But, like, then breaking comes along. And I see the backspin in flash dance. It was just a natural progression that I fucking still need that shit. I need that backspin. I've never seen it before, but I need it. Sneak into flash dance 10 times, right, to see that. And fast forward, hoping I'm healing like now I can roll up to any club. I ain't waiting in line. I'm guest listed. Those are floor masters. They're rolling in. And I was the oldest in the crew. I put the crew together. My crew, if they were here, we were all dysfunctional, angry young men. A number of my crew grew up in the hood, single moms, beaten with electrical cords, child protection brought in, um, not being fed for five days. And they would say if we, and they would say, and we're not fucking trying to make some big story. It's like if we didn't have each other as a crew, we probably wouldn't have survived it. So there's some survival mechanisms, things that just were very deep for us. Fast forward, I have this experience where I end up, I love nature and canoeing. And I, I do this thing where I volunteer all summer taking probation kids on 15-day wilderness canoe trips in Algonquin Park in Canada, which is like full wilderness, wolves and everything, right? And I realize, oh, damn. I'm really good at talking to angry young men. Oh, damn. That's because I'm an angry young man, right? And it got me thinking about, oh, maybe social work is a thing. And I'll talk about this in, in, in a minute. But then this sets the stage for why I end up landing in the UK. Because I was doing my master's. And very few b-boys went to university in the early years. I'm not saying I was the first, but... Like, trust me, I know the old school B-boys around the world and very few you, people went to university back in the day. Now lots of people go to university and there's lots of hip hop studies and all this. <clears throat> but I needed it and I was still healing when I came to England. And then I meet this group of people that kind of like, yeah, he looks like a punk. He's got, I had a, I had a black and white mohawk when I was here. And they're like, because it was mostly black youth that were all coming from Brixton and stuff, hanging out. And then I meet Nick in, in Leicester Square. He brings me to the center. He introduces me to Billy, introduces me to Danny and Feathers and all these people. And it's like, that was the hip-hop love. I was like, oh, damn. 
They know I'm a b-boy, so I'm instantly accepted. They're going to take me around, and we become friends, and we did something called Freestyle 85. But it's just been a whole journey for me. I mean, that's the early days. And I thought I knew my story. Let's say that's 20 layers in that story. I had a fucking meltdown at Christmas. And I'm in therapy now. I'm telling you that because I'm proud that I'm in therapy. Because I still need it. And I still got, there's another 20 layers. And there's discovery. And I also thought I could heal some of that by doing the outreach. We're the most significant outreach Canada's ever seen in hip hop. We, we are the largest group therapy projects in the history of all our prison systems in Canada. And it grew out of hip hop. It's great stuff, and it's healing for me and my team, but it's still not enough. Like, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more. But I just want to say, like, we save our vulnerability is our strength. We say knowledge of self is an element of hip-hop, but we don't fucking enact it sometimes. And so that's a, that's a big question for all of us. Because, like, it, you know, old guy wanted to pass something down. It's like... I want happiness for everybody. I want community. Me and Jonesy were talking about, we were excited about the prospect of we were creating something new in the early days. And at some point, our own trauma might got in the way of some of that too. All right, that was a lot. I'm sorry for the long No, thing. no apologies tonight. Thank you. Um, no apologies. We're all advocates of therapy up here with the microphones. I'm going to hand you over to Nzinga. Thank you. I'm not great with a microphone, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, hip hop, for me, it came from <coughs> my family. Um, I wasn't born here, I was born in New York. So I've always heard about the elements of what New York brings. And then I came here and I am very much a Jamaican New Yorker. And I am now a Jamaican British person. And hip hop for me is that <coughs> outcast, hearing that sound of melody and music in our house that gets whittled through, it's empowering. And I've studied dance, I was a contemporary dancer, and I remember my moment that I felt like I needed to be more connected to it was my aunt who's in the circle with us who um, produces beats as well. So when I had to do my first solo piece, which was a contemporary piece, at the time I had gone through quite a lot of trauma myself and I decided to do my piece using one of Biggie's tracks called Suicidal Thoughts. And my aunt made it into an instrumental because I brought it to the group and my teacher said, the language in it is terrible, we can't use it. So I used the instrumental version. And I was able to have a conversation with the audience that I wasn't able to have with anybody else. And that's when I realized that actually movement is a tool. And the more we are able to use these tools that we have naturally, they create spaces for conversation and they create spaces for conversations for communities that aren't allowed to do that. And I'm from a community that we don't talk, um, we communicate, we support, we raise each other, we assist each other. Um, it's Again, it's that village. But again, the conversation and the language is sometimes not there, but I felt like that language was there when I could do it through movement. And those were those pinnacle moments for me. Um, and then being back in the space of East London dance, meeting amazing dancers, people that do this work so well, made me realize actually there's so much impact and importance in there. And I didn't realize that I was onto something or I was doing something until I met, I'm so glad she's here today, Colleen, um, who gave me moments where she was like, hold on a second, you know that you're helping people with trauma. And I was like, what? And I feel that sometimes you need people to empower you. You need people to listen to a voice that you have. And each of us have these voices. And that's why there's so much important between working with young people, but seeing representation and representation that's being validated for you and for other people in the space. So that's my hip hop moment. Could you also, you said yesterday, it's been a really nice couple of days, I feel like we've been in this little bubble, all of us here, but yesterday we were talking about stuff and you just started talking about your family and the lineage of healing um, female 
strong female women. Um, I, I thought that was just really nice to share because I think it, it shines through your practice. Yeah, so my family, we are a bunch of strong women. Um, <coughs> and I say this with an abbreviation because our strength is in what we want to carry the strength in. It's not given to us. It's not labelled on us. We carry that strength because we do the work. My grandmother, um, who worked with mentally ill people in South Tottenham for a very long time. And I remember growing up seeing her have Christmas parties and we'd have to go to Monument Way, which is the house where the um, residential home where they lived. And they were normalized. Everyone was normalized in the same space because we was all one. Um, not only that, when we came, my family were part of the Pan-African movement. So we had to go to Saturday school where we learned about African liberation and how it was important to be a black person in London. And we was a part of the movement of reparation and we still do that much of reparation every year, which I take my children to. So there's so much important that's been embedded into us. My mum, um, an artist, social worker, she works in children's homes. <coughs> she currently teaches community kitchens. My mum has been doing that work for years. My auntie, who's in this space right now, is an art therapist. And we continue to do work that helps us. And my family, we've got a home where we work with elderly people in Jamaica. Um, we're from a Rastafari family, so we help elderly people in the community to connect, to get books. We wash their hair, we give them food, we provide spaces for them. And it's a caring family because it is a village. And I am a part of that village and my lineage is gonna be my kids. My great my grandmother did the same thing. So I have to continue to do the same as well. Thank you. I think it's really important. I really want you to, to share that because our culture is so important. The cultures that sometimes when you're a kid, you're like, oh God, I've got to do that thing. And actually, you know, it's your, it's your foundation. And I feel like it's really nice to have a, a woman, black woman in this organization that's talking about generations of a family that are doing the work. <coughs> so thank you. 